Okay, welcome everyone to our last lecture of our lecture series on a practical guide to superconducting qubit experiments. So in this very last class, I will chair the session and uh, Michael Hatchage, who ha you have been very familiar with so far, will give the very last talk on um, engineering cryogenic environments for quantum experiments. Um, Michael, of course, needs no introduction by now, but uh, he's in, he's an associate professor in uh, University of Pittsburgh, and uh, he has been organizing this uh, this uh, um, tutorial series with me. So, um, go ahead, Michael. Great, and I want to just thank everybody, um, you know, both as a speaker today and uh, as co-organizer with Chin for showing up to all these sessions. And then a few last pieces of business before we're exhausted at the end of the tutorial. There is a YouTube link uh, for these talks. You are welcome to share that you know, with all and sundry. They're currently unlisted because they're supposed to get upgraded in the coming weeks and posted on the website. So these talks are not gonna go away. Um, they are gonna get upgraded. So if you look back in the future and find them not at the link where you expect, uh, you know, go to the opportunities page of, of C2QA education's uh, portion uh, to find them. Okay, with that, uh, let's get started. So. Yeah, and the I, final reminder is okay. that everyone, please, you're welcome to type in questions in the Q&A box, and uh, I will either res respond in text or I will uh, group questions together and ask Michael live in the session. Great. Um, and and um, so by way of introduction, I was kind of asked uh, uh, or slash self-assigned myself during this, this planning of this, this tutorial to talk about some of the nitty gritty business about actually putting uh, these qubit systems in the fridge. So today's talk is, is a little bit different than the ones you've seen thus far. Like the word transmon is not gonna really appear until you know well into the talk. Uh, I also you know just warn you, a lot of the stuff that we're gonna talk about today, a lot of the things that, that really matter are sort of old school cryogenics. So you'll notice that things look a little different maybe than you're used to, but I promise you by the end, we'll explain to you why in terms of your T1 and T2, we need to, to be concerned about all this stuff. Okay, so uh, a good starting place for us, useful references, because this is old school cryogenics, here is the Bible of old school cryogenic material properties by Frank Pobel, materials and matters at low temperatures, matter and methods at low temperatures. You'll see lots of graphs from that today. Um, another book I really enjoy is called Richardson and Smith, or some people call it the, the Cornell book, Experimental Techniques in Condensed Matter Physics at Low Temperatures. It's really a bunch of chapters put together by practicing experimentalists uh, in the field on like methods of how to build calorimeters and fridges and you know this, that, and the other. So these are really nice um, classic books that for instance, when I was preparing this lecture, I did a lot of reading in. Then in terms of specifically equipping a fridge for qubits, there are way too many uh, for me to cite. I just cited two that I'm gonna use today and that I really enjoy. So Krinner um, out of the Walruff group has this really nice, very thorough discussion of how you build, what materials you use, what are the concerns, basically a lot of the stuff that we're gonna talk about today, plus a lot of the, the, the nittier, grittier details. So this is a really nice picture. And then I like this paper here, uh, Chakram PRL out of Dave Schuster's group, because they do a very honest uh, job of explaining to you the confusion about filters and how you sort of still have to experiment. I'll, I'll show you some of their data later in the talk. Okay, so with those references out of the way, how are we gonna proceed? So we're gonna start at the beginning, a little bit about cryogens, refrigerators, and materials at low temperatures. And then the, you know, the middle part of the talk, we're gonna get into the wide world of filtering and why we have all of this stuff on these complicated diagrams. And, and then at the end, I, I just wanna to point to some areas of concern. Really how you filter and equip a fridge is not subtle science. This is something that you know, when Chin and I or any three professors get together after we, you know, after we uh, get into the conversation, it usually ends up as this conversation that we keep having over and over again of how to build this, these fridges correctly. Okay, cryogenic liquids. So for you experimentalists, you know, this is a loading dock where these big bottles are delivered. There's really heavy steel ones. There's really light aluminum ones. These are called doers. They're basically fancy thermos bottles. And inside them, right, are, are liquids that would not be liquid at room temperature. Um, here's some liquid nitrogen being poured out of a cup. You know, it, it comes in many different flavors. You, this is just a, a very short selection, methane, oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen, helium. 
Um, we're going to talk about two isotopes of helium today. The sort of regular one with two protons and two neutrons is helium-4. Uh, in a little bit, we'll talk about helium-3, which is missing a neutron, and how we're going to use it. And so the idea here is that if you want something to be at 77 Kelvin, you buy one of these doers and you pour the stuff onto whatever you want to cool down. And when it is immersed in a doer at 77 Kelvin, that's how you cool stuff down. Um, a nitrogen doer is one full of nitrogen, a helium doer is one full of helium and so on and so forth. And I think by the standards of the field, getting something to four Kelvin is pretty much child's play. You just basically buy some helium and, and, and pour it on. You know, one important thing to realize is that all of these liquids have vapor pressure. If you pump that vapor pressure away, then, you know, the system is out of equilibrium and the hot molecules in the liquid are going to promote themselves to being vapor. And then the, the liquid is going to cool down. And so here is the first of many plots from Pobel today. This is the vapor pressure above some liquid. So it's like, imagine like a long tube full of liquid and I'm pumping on the top. Uh, in fact, here's what it looks like in something called a 1K pot. Here's a straw bringing helium three, uh, sorry, helium four into a uh, literally a pot or a cup. And then I'm sucking on the top to, to pump off the vapor. And you see, for instance, I can take nitrogen and cool it down from 77 to something like 50. This uh, dot here from Pobel is, is what he calls the practical lowest temperature or pressure. Like if you pump with a reasonable pumping system, this is as well as you can do. I've never personally used hydrogen, but here it is. And then much more common down here at the bottom are helium-3 and helium-4. And again, you see that the helium-4 should be somewhere at 4.2 Kelvin at atmospheric conditions. If I pump it down in this configuration here, I can get to right about a Kelvin, a little above. And so we call that a 1K pot. Helium-3 um, is really expensive and precious. I really never let it boil away. I always operate it in some closed circuit, but if I again, pour a doer full of helium-3 and then pump on it, I can get down to um, around 0.3 Kelvin. So all of these things have names you may run into in the literature, like a pumped nitrogen fridge or a helium-3 fridge is helium-3 being pumped. So you can see that they reach 0.3, 1. Uh, so these are ways with the addition of pumping systems and maybe even recirculating systems to get a little bit lower than the 4 Kelvin you can get by just putting stuff in a pot of helium. And then, of course, uh, there are actually many different um, ways of cooling below this, but the one that, that, that you've seen many, many pictures on, right? When you see a quantum computer on the internet, it's this weird inverted chandelier, and somewhere in back is something with little fins on it. That is a dilution unit, and it runs on a mixture of helium-3 and helium-4. Um, the idea here in this phase diagram, here's temperature, here's like percentage of helium-3 that's in the mix. So 100% is pure helium-3, 0% is pure helium-4. Uh, the idea here is as you take a mixture of this stuff and you cool it down, it's gonna actually separate into two um, phases. So like oil and water, you're gonna have a pure helium-3 phase and this dilute helium-3 phase. So this is mostly helium-4, mostly helium-3. And then what happens to make a fridge interesting is that as you have gas moving, uh, sorry, as you have molecules of helium-3 moving across the space boundary, it takes energy to do so. And so the idea is that you're going to put in helium-3 on this side, take it away from that side. So it's going to be continuously flowing across that boundary. It's going to be pulling heat from the environment. And that uh, in a really nice system can get you to one or two or something like that millicolon. I'm going to not say anything more about the details of, of you know, the dilution unit and the helium-3 and all of this stuff. Um, we should just understand that, again, this is once more a pumped cryogenic system, and we can get ourselves down with it to something like 10 millikelvin. The way we do that is to put together what people call a dilution refrigerator. It's important to understand that, um, much like when you have vacuum pumps or amplifiers, uh, or any one of these layered systems. You kind of use scheme one to get part of the way, scheme two to get further, scheme three, scheme four. This is a layered cryoset. So this is a uh, conventional wet fridge. So this is all the fridges you would have seen like before the early 2000s. And you literally layer the cryogens. You have an outer doer that you pour full of liquid nitrogen that will cool everything inside it to 77 Kelvin. Then you have another insulating doer and you fill a vessel with 4.2 Kelvin helium four. So that's the helium bath here. And then you have a vacuum vessel inside that. So now everything inside there has been cooled to 4.2 Kelvin. 
you add one more heating layer typically. So here's again, that little straw I showed you before. So that's helium four being sucked out into the separate little pot and then pumped out to room temperature. That's a one K pot. And now I can cool stuff to, to one Kelvin. And that's cold enough that what I can do now is to take my helium three, the one I wanna use in my dilution refrigerator, flow it down through these stages, cool it to 77, to four, to one, uh, use an impedance and pressure to make it condense into a liquid and the liquid will drip down into the bottom of the fridge where I have my dilution unit, where I have my dilute phase and my helium three rich phase. And I have that helium three molecule now that I put into the fridge crossing over. Once it's crossed over, it's no good to me. And so I'm gonna pull it out from the other side with a pump. And because helium three is fantastically expensive, I'm not gonna pump this away. I'm gonna run a closed system just running the same helium three round and round in a circle forever. And because you can imagine that, you know, I have to heat this helium three up and heat it back down and not lose energy in the process. Uh, the most of the things you see when you're looking at a dilution unit are exchangers that allow the outgoing liquid or gas to cool the incoming liquid or gas to try to make the system as efficient as possible. Okay, so that's the dill fridge. In terms of like the later filtering discussion, we're going to have what it tells you is that you have for free these sort of temperatures available to you. If you'd like to cool something down, for instance, the microwave light uh, traveling in your transmission line, you have available to you a source of coldness at 77, at four, at one. The still is around uh, here, it says 600 millikelvin, maybe 700 millikelvin. And then of course, down here at the bottom, 10 millikelvin. So you'll see typically that people take advantage of these different stages to sort of sequentially cool their line down as they pass light into the fridge. That's very standard. Um, I don't think any of the commercial entities that make fridges and produce these pictures on the internet use wet fridges anymore because the big um, changeover in the 2000s was that we can, instead of all of these liquid cryogens, that's what makes it wet. So the inner part's always full of cryogens, but this outer part is what we mean by wet. We can make a dry fridge by buying this thing called a pulse tube refrigerator. It takes lots and lots of wall power. So like something like eight or 10 kilowatts of wall power um, it takes lots and lots of cooling water, but it will produce at four Kelvin about one watt of cooling. And that's quite nice because now we just need electricity and cooling water and it replaces the 4.2 Kelvin and the 77 Kelvin. The stages of this pulse tube uh, are something like 50 and three Kelvin and they will now replace the liquid cryogens. And we like it because we don't have to transfer stuff. We can change the form factor of the fridge. It doesn't have to be shaped like a long skinny thermos bottle anymore. And so these dry fridges um, are all the ones that you see on the internet as being filled with quantum computers. If you've ever been to an experimental laboratory, that pulse tube is a thing goes If you've ever wondered what that strange heartbeat is, that's this thing uh, basically providing the outer cooling circuits that allow the fridge to get cold enough to run. Okay, any questions so far, Chin? Yeah, uh, a couple of quick ones. So one is kind of obvious, but could you comment on whether wet or dry fridge is better? Which one is better and on what basis? And the second one is, are you aware of any hybrid wet dry dilution refrigerators? Um, okay, good questions. So I, I had tried to avoid, okay, um, I'm a Texan. Texas is famous for oil, right? But the oil that came up in Texas in like the early 1900s had like lots and lots of helium-4 in it. So that's where people got their helium was from oil wells. Helium-4 is not a very like common, easy to obtain gas, which means that when people like Chin and I buy liquid helium these days, I think it costs Chin how much, 25 a liter? I haven't bought helium for, okay. for a while. I think yeah. it's something like 20 or $25 a liter. Um, that's a lot harder and more exotic. And if we let it escape, it actually leaves the, you know, it leaves the Earth's atmosphere. So we're not getting it back. So I would say that wet fridges are basically dying out because unless you really, really need it, unless you have what's called a reliquifier to recapture and recondense this helium four, it's both really expensive and, and hard to obtain. It's a very sort of slender pipeline. So everyone is very happy. You know, everyone has wall power and cooling water and it's much nicer to run this. I'd point out that this is full of helium actually. Uh, it's just a sealed system, so we don't have to worry about constantly replenishing it. So I would say that dry fridges are just more practical. Also, in terms of size, if you've ever seen the size of a big helium dry uh, wet fridge, it's like two fists put together. Whereas, you know, dry fridges are like my arms and the size of my torso. So we can just make these much more bigger, much more easily 
without having to make them 50 foot tall. So I think you know, that's why we have dry fridges. The second question was, can you mix them? Yes, you can, for instance, get a dry fridge with a liquid nitrogen prequel circuit. That, that is an option you can commercially buy. Um, you wouldn't usually mix helium-4 and the pulse tube because it's kind of like having a hat on top of a hat. But there are, for instance, liquid nitrogen prequel circuits and stuff like this that you can buy uh, for these fridges that would make them like a mixed wet dry fridge. Okay, well, was there a third question? And there are a couple. So okay. uh, why is, uh, does the vibration, uh, on vibration of the pulse tube, uh, does it matter to qubit experiments? And uh, how do you reduce vibration coupling from the pulse tube? Good question. Um, at some level, uh, so I will, this is kind of a, a hint for later in the talk. Every problem you can imagine is a problem at some level. I would say that right now, you know, the world's best uh, qubits are measured in these dry systems. So I'm guessing it's not the limit so far. Um, in terms of how you damp stuff, that's actually not in this tutorial. Uh, as you'll see, cryogenic materials are pretty strange. Cryogenic vibration isolation is stranger still. Uh, I'm going to leave that as like, you know, a more advanced topic. Okay. And, um, uh, can you, and can you explain a bit how a pulse tube work? Um, uh, yeah, it goes and it takes in eight kilowatts and it gets cold. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, in the same way that I'm not explaining the DIL units, it's, it's you know, really nice thermodynamics, but, um, but no, not for today. Okay, so before we get any more questions that I can't answer, um, what you have bought with this giant stack of layered cooling systems is the ability to cool stuff down. I put 10-ish millikelvin as sort of a standard temperature. I think a really nice fridge, especially when it's empty, might be five millikelvin. Most people's fridges, if you actually like twist their arm and say, really, what temperature is it when it's all loaded up? Maybe more like 20 millikelvin. So somewhere in this sort of low millikelvin range. Um, you know, you have these incoming gas, you have this outcoming gap, you have these heat exchangers trying to be efficient. But unfortunately, the cooling capacity, that is the ability to handle extra heat. So here's applied heat. This is the, we have a fridge in the lab named Texas. It's a DR200. It's called 200 because when you apply 200 microwatts of heat, it heats to around 100 millikelvin. So when you see this, the cooling power on these fridges, the number 300, 400, 500, 1,000 is how many microwatts of heat will heat it to 100 millikelvin. But of course, we don't really want to operate our qubits at 100 millikelvin. And because it's a quadratic curve, for instance, you know, a few microwatts of heat applied to the DIL unit will heat it up to something like 20 millikelvin. So when you come down and we talk about filters and dissipation later in, in this talk, keep in mind, that a few microwatts is enough to, you know, to really push your fridge out of whack. And 100 microwatts is enough to take it way past the temperature where you want to operate it. So we don't really have a lot of cooling power um, by, by sort of, you know, naive expectations of how well these fridges will run. Okay. Um, the other thing that is going to matter a lot in this talk is that materials properties change, and I put here sometimes wildly, with temperature. And so, for instance, here's another Cobell plot. Here's temperature on the horizontal axis and log units. Here's thermal conductivity, right? If I want to connect two different things and have heat flow, I want to put some copper here or aluminum in between. How much heat will flow for how much gradient is the thermal conductivity? One really important thing in cryogenic systems is that at room temperature, you have phonons and electrons that carry heat. And usually phonons are doing the majority of the work. But their ability to carry heat through the system is limited by the fact that they can scatter off each other and they can scatter off defects like wrong atoms or defects in the crystals of your material. So one really neat thing you can do because sort of thermal conductivity is about motion of electrons and phonons and electrical conductivity is about motion of electrons, which are the things that are gonna be left at very low temperatures anyways. You can measure something called the triple R, the residual resistivity ratio. And it basically tells you, is your metal like a pure crystalline metal or is it a mess? Because the idea is that as you cool this down, the phonons will freeze out. So all the scattering involving phonons will go away, but defects are still defects. And so that scattering will not go away. So if you think of like the softest copper you've ever melted with in your mess, uh, you've ever worked with in your life, imagine like speaker wire that's like, you know, really, really bendy copper. That might have a triple R in the thousands because it is a very, very pure metal with a very nice lattice. If you take an ugly alloy, 
like aircraft grade aluminum or stainless steel, that triple R might be closer to one. The idea is that you have so much defects limiting what's going on with the motion of electrons at room temperature that cooling it down and taking away the photons, the phonons does not help. Because of that, you'll see that for instance, aluminum alloy, right, with a very low triple R, it becomes less and less uh, thermally conductive as you cool it down. Whereas as you see the triple R rises across this plot, you see aluminum and copper crossing each other back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, right? Copper is notionally um, a somewhat better conductor than aluminum at room temperature, but you see maybe at 10 Kelvin, it matters far more how clean the copper is uh, than whether it's copper or aluminum. For that reason, the number one way to carry heat in any cryo system is what's called OFHC copper, oxygen free, high conductivity copper. It's a thing you can buy off uh, McMaster or whoever your favorite supplier is. It's basically been purified. To keep in mind, it is a terrible construction material. Like no one in their right mind at room temperature would build something out of this stuff. Everything that makes a metal strong is like alloying to disrupt the crystal, you know, mixing other metals in and um, that's not what this is. It's extremely soft. It's a very poor construction material. Your machinist will not like it. But, you know, because it has uh, this really good thermal conductivity, it's what basically everything is built out of. The other one, um, more for middle, micro, uh, middle cryogenic temperatures, but also just a fun example of how things change. Uh, as I'll show you, at very low temperatures, sapphire is a really good insulator. At like middle cryogenic temperatures, it's actually one of the very best thermal conductors you can buy. You know, so you'll see if you're trying to move heat around in different parts of cryo systems for middle temperatures, you'll often see sapphire everywhere you're gonna see copper. Um, here's more Pobel, these are great plots. Uh, I hope they show okay on your screens. Here's temperature again, here's thermal conductivity. This one runs from one Kelvin uh, to like room temperature. And then this run ones from one Kelvin down. And what you can see is that dev, dem, dedicated cryogenic scientists have like cooled down everything you could possibly imagine and asked the question, is it a good uh, thermal conductor? And so for instance, here's Sapphire, this curve right here. And you'll notice at like 10, 20, 30 Kelvin, except for, uh, well, you know, basically it's the highest material that, that, that people you know, measure on this chart. So Sapphire, which people think of at cryogenic like Dilfridge temperatures as a really good insulator is actually a really good conductor. And then here's copper and aluminum, which are substantially below it. But then uh, as the phonons freeze out of sapphire at even lower temperatures, you see that now silver and copper are gonna take over as uh, two of the best uh, things that we can buy and use. And of course, you know, silver looks much better and you might ask, why don't we use silver? And the answer is, because it costs a lot? Um, one other thing to see here, Helium-2, this is another name for superfluid helium-4. You'll notice that it's also head and shoulders above everything at similar temperatures. And this is why when some uh, experimentalist comes to you, and, and I'm sorry theorists, but we do it all the time and say, oh, my fridge is dead. Um, it's because for instance, if you lose a helium into your cryostat and it forms a superfluid film, it will absolutely carry heat where it's not supposed to go. If we now look at even lower temperatures, so now this is below a Kelvin, Right, and then here is 50 millikelvin. So getting into Dilfridge temperatures down here at the bottom left, you'll see that it's a little hard to see. This curve right here is stainless steel and here's copper and nickel right to it. And they are terrible conductors of heat. They're orders of magnitude worse than the different kinds of copper up here towards the top of the graph. And so stainless steel is gonna be a material we use as a physically strong thermal insulator. It's not an electrical insulator, but it's a thermal insulator. And so amusingly here is cold sapphire. So, you know, um, sapphire, which I told you was so amazing um, at 20, 30 Kelvin by 100 millikelvin is again, orders and orders of magnitude worse uh, than something like copper, which was previously beating. So that's really nice. The other thing I wanna show you on this graph is metals like aluminum, when they become superconducting, right? Superconducting binds, Cooper pairs, all the photons and electrons pair up and now they're not available to carry heat anymore. And so you see here's normal metal aluminum, which has been kept normal by a large magnetic field. Here's superconductive aluminum. And you'll notice that they didn't extend the plot, but it's headed, it's headed south at a frantic rate. So this is really gonna be, superconductors are gonna be the best thermal insulators that we have available to us. Okay, 
And just a few other fun things. Here's nylon, here's Teflon, here's graphite. Apiazon is a cryogenic grease. You see people trying various kinds of glue. Clearly the people who, who built these plots were trying to figure out how to build stuff at low temperatures, just like we are. And, and the, the takeaway from this is to not trust anything you know, even at four Kelvin to be true at 10 millikelvin, right? In my mind, there's kind of different sets of materials and what they are and what they do. Aluminum, mediocre conductor at room temperature. Four Kelvin, pretty okay. You know, one Kelvin and below, superconducting. Every material sort of has to be classified differently in your mind at the different stages of the dill fridge. Um, so Michael, a uh, quick question. Do you anneal OFHC copper after machining and does it matter to its property? It would, mm. In principle, it would be good to anneal it like in a vacuum oven. However, um, annealing it will often make it so soft that like it won't hold its shape anymore. So in some of our machines that we build, we take OFHC and we weld it, which has the property of accidentally annealing it. And you can bend them with your hands. So in general, we don't tend to, uh, if it is a bendy flexy thing, sure, anneal it. If it is a thing like a fridge plate that should hold a shape and not get caved in when someone pokes it with a finger, no. Okay, um, in terms of materials that people use to span sp stages, you know, stainless steel, again, it's strong and you saw at low temperatures and in general, because it is a nasty alloy, it's a pretty bad thermal electrical conductor. Um, it's not that great, but it's strong, so we can make it very, very thin. Something like titanium would be much better, uh, of course, but titanium is very hard to buy in thin tubes. There's gerolite or G10, so you can see this kind of greenish looking stuff here that's basically fiberglass. It is both an electrical and thermal insulator, and people use it down to the Kelvin and below range. There are other materials like for wiring, like manganin and constantin. I think they're basically the same thing. Again, they're a nasty alloy with very high near constant resistance versus temperature. You can use them to wind up heaters and, and voltage leads, but they do not carry heat. And then again, like I said, copper nickel is kind of similar to stainless steel. It's a binary alloy. And then of course, superconductors, um, super pairs don't carry heat, right? So the best thing to stand off temp uh, temperatures uh, well below their TC are superconductors. Just to show you that I'm not making this all up out of a chart in Pobel, here is uh, that same Dilfridge, Texas that happened to be open this week. This is the Dill unit. These are the heat exchangers. You'll notice that all the plates are gold plated copper. I would note we've had several comments about gold in these tutorials. I don't think the gold is there to make it better. The gold is there to protect it from you and your fingers and the acid in your fingers, which will tend to corrode metals if you touch stuff. So that's why they're gold plated. Um, Anywhere you want to carry cryogenic liquids around or have a standoff, you have a thin, here's a thin steel tube. That's a standoff. Here's a thin steel tube carrying liquids. Um, you'll see here that in the, the um, heat exchangers, they don't want them thermally shorted. Here are graphite rods with Teflon uh, lock washer, or sorry, washers. So you can see that, you know, the, all these materials here are, are pretty carefully chosen for, for good reasons. In the same way, when we build stuff on the fridge that uh, span stages, we have to pick similar materials for the same reasons. So here are the microwave lines in my fridge. These are all made out of stainless steel inner and outer conductors. Here are my output lines where I really want low losses. Uh, they're made out of superconductor. And these lines can run between stages because they don't carry heat, or at least not very well. OK, so um, given all of these like tribulations and comments and caveats, why do we need to be so cold? I think this is a good question to continually ask ourselves. The first answer that typically like uh, one of my students comes up with is not maybe the right one though. If this is my fridge, some bath at temperature T and here's my transmon or whoever qubit with levels G and E, they're separated by energy omega GE, then I can calculate the partition function and say that the probability of being in the excited state is this thing right here, basically the the component of the partition function for the excited state divided by Z, the total partition function. If I open Mathematica, which I did uh, earlier this week and say, okay, a typical transmon is maybe five gigahertz, a really nice dill fridge is five millikelvin, at least that's what it says on the, the, on the thermometer. Well, I calculate my qubit should be like fantastically cold. Uh, and Chin is smirking because no qubit in the history of man has ever been this cold. 
maybe it's more like that they actually are at 50 millikelvin because it's very hard to thermalize these very decoupled objects. Then you would get something like a percent population. Uh, still pretty good, but at least more believable. And so people will say you have to have a dill fridge and it has to be below 50 millikelvin to keep this population low. But that's not really true. For instance, fluxonium has a GE transition that's typically like a half a gigahertz, so 10 times smaller, right? And if I take this same more realistic temperature, it's like 40% excited. It's starting to close in on the 50-50 of infinite temperature. This is a problem if you don't have quantum measurement but we're required to have Q and D quantum measurement to do quantum error correction and everything else we wanna do with our quantum computer. So the reason we need the fridge to be so cold is not actually really to prepare the ground state. We're gonna fix this problem with good quantum measurement as we've talked about in several previous tutorials. The reason we need the fridge to be so cold is everything else. Okay, so this is a very depressing um, plot. So frequencies at which the noise or fluctuations in the environment matter, and it's, it's basically all of them spanning, you know, fractions of a gigahertz to many hundreds of gigahertz. So everything matters because this superconducting material that we make the qubits out of and the qubits themselves, they're all very nonlinear, which means that things that happen at one frequency are very good at um, affecting things at other frequencies. So Chen told us before, this is stolen from his tutorial, that if you have pair breaking radiation. So radiation above the gap of aluminum, these nice Cooper pairs can be broken apart to these two effectively like electrons that are stuck and cannot partner with each other uh, very easily. This pair breaking radiation, it does all the bad things. Your qubit relies on being in a superconductor as sort of a prerequisite. If you're breaking this down, T1, T2, T5, they're all gonna suffer um, substantial degradation. So you care a lot about high frequency stuff in this 100 gigahertz range. Coming down into the more reasonable sort of one to 10 gigahertz range, we have cavities. We've talked about them extensively and we have qubits. And of course, radiation near the qubit frequency will flip the qubit. And radiation near the cavity frequency, or maybe it's harmonics here, I've drawn like one, there could be several harmonics of the cavity, will read out the qubit. That is the mechanism we use for dispersive readout. So stray light here or noise will destroy the, the phase of any superposition state of your qubit because it's being read. Um, there's like a little bit of a merciful gap here. And then, you know, low frequency stuff will tend to push, for instance, the frequency of your qubit around with charge or flux variations. Those are again gonna cause dephasing. These low frequency components are the ones that tend to be equitable. Okay, so the reason that we need to be so cold, right, is not just like we want the qubit to be in the ground state, is that we have to control this entire spectrum here. And, and, and you know we really need to carefully clean up light at all of these different frequencies it wants to make the system work. And that's gonna get us into the meat of our talk. Oh, and then there's Chen's, there's Chen's lightning bolt. Okay. Now I have light at room temperature, microwave uh, signals. I'm gonna assume that there are 300 Kelvin worth of noise on these signals, that there are fluctuations on these transmission lines that are equivalent to their temperature of 300 Kelvin. If I have amplifiers and stuff, it could be even worse, but let's just start with that. I don't want 300 Kelvin radiation passing down my transmission lines and, and, and trying to heat my cavity to an effective RF temperature of 300 Kelvin. So the number one way I stop that is with cold attenuators uh, on my input lines. So the idea here is here's my room temperature input. It's passing down to the stages of a cryo system. Here's a T attenuator. So it's basically, if you look inside this three resistors, R1, R2, R3, they act like a 50 ohm resistor, but this R3 eats most of the power. And so uh, they're gonna absorb signals. They're also gonna absorb incoming noise or fluctuations, and then they're gonna re-emit down the chain at the temperature that they're at. So for instance, if I have a signal coming into my 20 dB attenuator at four Kelvin from this 300 Kelvin source, P sig divided by hundred, so 20 dB is a factor of hundred exits. So I'm gonna cut down my signal by a factor of hundred. Now in terms of the temperature of fluctuations in the line, the output temperature is gonna be the temperature of the attenuator plus any sort of thermal fluctuations that bleed through. So Tn divided by A. So in this scenario, you see, uh, at four Kelvin on almost all fridges, you'll see like a 20 dB attenuator. That's because instead of 300 Kelvin fit radiation passing further down the fridge, you're gonna get four Kelvin emission 
plus three Kelvins worth of bleed through. So about seven Kelvin of total fluctuations. And you can imagine that if I go to lower and lower temperature and I stack up more and more of these attenuators, then I can basically cool my line to some very, very low temperature. If everything was classical, this would be a little easier. Uh, so here's Johnson noise, right? Um, that the, the noise basically goes linearly with the temperature. Of course, in real life, we're gonna get to the quantum regime and sort of get stuck at the half a, fluctu a, half a photon of, of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And so you see that because of this bending over of this curve, this cough-like behavior of the noise in the system, as I try to add some frequency, go to lower and lower temperatures, you need more attenuation than you expect. So in, in, the, in this nice reference here, you can find out more in the Krinner reference that I showed you at the beginning and we'll show you again in a little bit. We can get these details right. I just wanna to say to you that you're gonna find more attenuation than you expect. Part of the reason is because of, of this right here, that to get into the quantum regime, to have a very, very, very low photon occupancy, you have to work a little harder. But that is really, really complicated by the fact that the attenuator is not just there to clean up noise. It's there to pass signals like pi pulses, like measurement pulses, gates, all this good stuff down into the fridge. But the attenuator does this by eating power. So if I put zero dBm, which is one milliwatt of power into one port of my attenuator, on the other side, I collect um, a hundredth of a milliwatt, 10 microwatts of power because of this attenuator here, I'm just assuming is 20 dB. But that means that this attenuator ate 99% of that milliwatt of power. And now it has to get that power out of the attenuator or it will heat up and it will re-radiate that higher temperature down the fridge. And given all the materials conversations we just had, you should have you know, um, an immediate flag. This is a stainless steel bodied attenuator. This is very, very common. This is what you can easily buy. And you should have immediate questions. How does this attenuator shed heat? Why does it have a steel case? Like, what are the trade-offs in this thing? And, and, and this is a very real problem. I'll, I'll show you a little bit more about it later in the talk. But the rough idea, right, of how we get started getting ready to have some quantum system in the bottom of our fridge is to stack up way more attenuation than we want and to deal with all the heating problems that come with it in order that the cavity, for instance, which reads out our qubit can be cold enough to not immediately have the qubit dephase. So I showed you that the qubit is, is sensitive to sort of all sorts of temperature bands, sorry, frequency bands. Um, one really nice strategy for every other frequency we don't need to use, so say not, you know, not the qubit frequency, not the cavity frequency, we have certain bands we need to drive. We should take everything else, and instead of eating that light, we should just reflect it. And so these are um, usually low pass filters, but they could be band pass or high pass filters also in the fridge. Here's a picture of one, again, a steel housing. And the idea here is if you send light into one side in the pass band, it will transmit. So this should be like one transmission through this thing, unity transmission as close as we can get. At frequencies that I don't want to use and I do want to protect my qubit, we have the stop band. It just reflects that signal higher up the fridge. But then of course, for lumped filters, they fail due to stray capacitance and ductance on the elements are built out of transmission line bait filters, which is what this is, fail for similar reasons. For instance, some lambda over four element goes to lambda over two element and some impedance changes. And so they will have like upper pass bands or sort of failure bands where they don't keep filtering. So it's very common in fridges to have a low pass filter, say, I don't need to drive above this ever, just try to block out all light from higher frequencies from getting in and messing up your qubit. Um, but we don't expect that to work at 100 gigahertz or 200 gigahertz. These commercial components, they're already not usually designed to be cooled down. They're definitely not designed to work at 200 gigahertz. And so we need something that really slams the door on high frequency light and gets nice and cold um, while absorbing or reflecting that light. And so here, um, this, we use this material called Elkasorb. Uh, so I'm just trying to think which, which company we buy it from these days. I think we buy it from Creighton and then before that it was layered. And then, so it's a commercial material you can look up by this brand name. It's basically lossy black stuff. And the way we build an echo sort filter, you'll see here, this is a copper housing, right? Because we want it to thermalize. It's got two SMA connectors. And then we build a transmission line in here. So there's a center conductor here. The dielectric is the echo sorb itself. It has a dielectric of like two or three, the stuff we use. And this is like a lossy transmission line. But it's a lossy transmission line that hopefully continues to be lossy well up into the hundreds and hundreds of gigahertz of frequency. 
Um, I actually think this is a really nice picture showing you what it looks like when you cut it out. Uh, nobody's asked a question yet, or at least Chin hasn't passed it on. Like this transmission line should clearly have a straight conductor in the middle, right? So we hand build these. This is clearly one that went wrong. Um, the thing I can say in defense of my students is we only cut them in half if they're broken. So when I was looking around for pictures of Echosorb filters, um, I didn't have any perfectly made ones that had been cut in half, but this shows you what's going on inside. Okay, how this is gonna work. Obviously we would like zero dB where we care. So no loss where we care. And then lots and lots of loss elsewhere. This is, doesn't really approximate that shape very well, but the idea is you might have, let's say a dB or so of loss or a few dB of loss at your signal frequencies. Then of course you're gonna get higher loss as the frequency increases, which is, which is good. It's basically a linear slope of dB per frequency. And then the hope is that out here at let's say 200 gigahertz or something where a conventional filter has given out, this hopefully still really works and, and really gets cold. Okay. Okay, couple questions. So um, can you comment a bit on KNL filters? Because uh, we have seen KNL filters in multiple papers. Are they the best? And uh, <laughs> Okay, uh, that's a good question. So I'm gonna tell you, I guess, a little bit about my history in cryo. You should saw everything open and figure out what's inside. I will show you some more sawed open objects later on in the lab, uh, in, the, in the talk. When I was young, one of my jobs in the fridge, you know, like the, there was those YouTube ads, will it blend? We had, will it cool? Um, I don't think k filters are special, but for instance, when I find something where the materials it's made out of are cryocompatible, and I know that it works well at cold because they're not sold to be used at 10 millikelvin, they're meant to be used at 100 millikelvin for something I don't even know what, right? We just find them and we buy them. You will find that the field tends to really glom on to a supplier and a product that everybody knows works. And we tend to be like a little bit afraid of trying new objects. Um, I actually don't think they're the best. I'll show you some mini circuits filters that I think perform a little better. And I'm sure that if we wanted to custom build one, we could build one better than this. They just are, you know, in mini papers, a reasonable price and, and at least up until post COVID times, you know, relatively easy to get. So they're just convenient. They're not, they're not magic. Sorry, was there another question? Okay, so what filters do you use for DC lines? Are there any disadvantages of using copper powder filters or do you use some other filters for DC lines? Okay, um, I have to admit, I haven't used DC controls in many, many years uh, and I don't miss it. So <laughs> when I wrote this talk, I, I did, I left them out. Um, yes, there are like um, silicon carbide in stiecast type filters. There are copper powder in stiecast type filters. Um, really, yeah, I think, Huh? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I really just think we just layer them up, right? So I think you can make a copper powder filter with a roll off that's probably lower and sharper than these echo sub filters, which are designed to still be pretty okay at gigahertz frequencies. But you know, you might then just want to concatenate them. Okay. And uh, what material do you use for glue? And this question is also asking about do you glue flux lines on your cavity? I imagine that's quite specific, but what material do you use for glue? Okay, so the, the glue of cryogenesis is Stycast. I actually had a slide on Stycast and I was like, nobody cares about Stycast. I deleted it, clearly I shouldn't have. Um, Stycast, it comes in two flavors. Basically the black stuff I think is expansion matched to copper and the clear stuff is expansion matched to steel or maybe vice versa. Um, so basically you can just go buy Stycast and, and you know they, it's been used for decades, it works pretty well. Um, we do not glue our flux coils down. We wind them around little copper spindles and we just bolt them in place. Maybe we'll see one of them later as we go through the talk. Okay, yeah. This one, you may have to interpret the question yourself. Uh, is EchoSorb better than QDevil for qubit measurements? Does QDevil make a filter? Um, I, I'm, it's not clear to me. Okay, so I, I will tell you that, filter, so. yeah, I will tell you that you can now buy in the last just maybe two or three years commercial EchoSorb filters. They're probably just as nice uh, or better than ours, but we know how to make them and they're very cheap this way. So we just make them all ourselves. That's not to say other people's won't work. Um, just don't buy anything with a steel housing. Okay. 
On the input lines, you'll see that we're happy to basically murder our signal on the way down and have just enough power left to excite the cavity or excite the qubit. On the output lines, that signal that has the dispersive shift on it is very precious. So we need, again, this kind of like one-way valve or rethermalizing system. There we use circulators. And the idea here is that the signal in will pass through the circulator. If I draw a block diagram, it'll pass through with hopefully zero or very minimal loss this way. Then the circulator will just go back this way and back this way. It just goes in a circulating fashion. To make an isolator out of it, we basically put an absorptive attenuator here, or you see that this one from low noise factory is like permanently mounted. And the idea here is that one way through is zero loss or very close to it. On the way back, any noise and, and signal will get absorbed in the attenuator and just like, uh, sorry, yeah, this should not just say attenuator, this should say terminator. And then it will re-radiate just like an attenuator at the temperature that it is. So if you mount these uh, cold on your fridge, it will absorb heat from higher stages and, and um, re-emit to keep your system cool. These are far bulkier and far more expensive than attenuators, but they're the way that we can protect our precious signal that we need for our high fidelity qubit readout. Okay, so putting it all together on the left is something that uh, one of my students you know, is using to measure qubits in the fridge. Here's a qubit line, just like I showed you before. Here's a readout line, like I showed you before. We just drive the qubit and don't collect signals. So you see that we have attenuator, 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 low pass filter, echo sorb, more attenuators to clean this light up that drives the qubit. On the cavity side, we work in reflections. So you'll see this is an isolator letting signal only up and stopping back. This is a circulator acting as a circulator. So now we have the same kind of heavily attenuated line and then filters and echo sorb that you pass through twice and then pass up through to the head. And this Krinner paper, which I, again, I really enjoy and have refer to often, will help you calculate things. Like if you have 77K, 4K, still 100 mil Kelvin mixing chamber, you see one, two, three, four, five. If you put this pattern of attenuator, 0, 10, 0, 20, 30, you get a very low residual third photon occupancy at the bottom of your fridge. That sounds awesome. However, if you come over to this graph, each one of these stages has a finite amount of cooling power. And you'll see that for instance, this blue configuration is quite bad at the 100 millikelvin stage. If you try to pass a reasonable pi pulse through it uh, that they calculated in this paper, it's really gonna heat up this particular attenuator. If you do something else, for instance, 0, 20, 10, 10, 20, you see that it's much hotter, but it's much more tolerant of the pulses. And so then you need to pick, kind of choose your own adventure to understand what kind of pulses you're gonna apply, how sensitive you are to stray photons and, and try to like optimize this system. And then this doesn't account for the echo sorbs and the low pass filters. Clearly we kind of know good things versus bad thing, but what's the best? What is the one that we should all do? Um, we can talk about that, but we're not done yet because that's all stuff coming down the lines. Your, your chip is hopefully doing its best to thermalize to the temperature of the dilution refrigerator, but there are also stray photons, that is photons wandering around outside the lines to worry about. And there's magnetic field, right? These circulators and a lot of the stuff that we put in the bottom of the fridge can be quite magnetic. And so for instance, this is scanning squid microscopy of a field cooled superconductor and all these black spots here are vortices. I have some data actually from, from, from Chen's earlier work about how this is maybe not so bad later in the talk, but the rough idea is that you don't want your system chock full of vortices because those are basically little normal cores that can move around and dissipate. And so the other thing that we do, and this also helps with temporal stability of flux, is to basically wrap our individual experiments in something called cryoperm or mu metal, um, amu metal 4K. So the I forgot the reference here. This this stuff you can look up at amu Neil's uh, website. It is a very high permeability alloy at cryogenic temperatures. So mu metal right um, means high mu, and then cryo means like it's a good mu at cryo. It's easy to saturate, so you can't expose it to very strong fields. But if you, for instance, take a long cylinder of this stuff, um, you can't stop magnetic fields like you can electric fields, but you can pull them into this high mu material, which will create a lower field density in the vicinity of your samples. You kind of wrap a shield around it, pull the fields into the shield, and create a low field environment inside. Some people will also layer these with superconducting cans, at least the way I was always taught. This will not really 
expel flux. We all know that superconducting, at least single crystal type one superconductors that are small, have the Meissner effect where they'll kick out all the flux, which sounds better than mu metal. Real big macroscopic objects that may be cool in an interesting, you know, spatial way that have lots of defects in them that are far from single crystal. I was taught to assume that they will lock the field, but not expel it. So we use cryopern to try to get field out. We can also layer superconductor to try to hold field still. Okay, by this point, you know, blah. So should you believe me that like all these filter configurations are correct? Should I believe myself? Should my students believe me? And the answer is like, probably not. So this other paper that I, that I plugged at the beginning uh, out of Dave Schuster's group, these are actually two different papers with the same first author, did a really neat thing that people should do when they try to build their own systems, which is to take a qubit, you know, your favorite qubit, Bob, and measure T1 here in purple, T2 in yellow. We also get information from the number of th thermal photons in the qubit in equilibrium. And what you can see that the experimentalists are doing here are playing with all sorts of adjustments and filtering, adjustments and shielding, putting on stuff that maybe they don't believe it makes a difference, doesn't make a difference, right? And you see that they take a 10 microsecond qubit with a two microsecond T2 to something like a 100 microsecond qubit with also almost 100 microsecond T2. And they made something like an order of magnitude improvement in the, the thermal excitations. And I would point out to you that this is not different qubits, this is the same qubit. And so um, this is also really irksome. You see, this is like 15 runs of the cryostat. So that's probably half a year's worth of work. But unfortunately with all the things and all the trade-offs and, and performance metrics that we don't fully understand about how all this stuff works locked in the bottom of a dill fridge, uh, we certainly, and I'll show you on the next slide in our lab, find these kind of studies to be very valuable. So, and then uh, for instance, as a result of all these studies, You'll find, I'm very happy to say, in many papers these days, very carefully drawn diagrams with lots of extra details about which brand and kind of attenuator, how much loss on the echo sorb filter, like really, really detailed. And so, for instance, I just, uh, you know, this is just one example I picked because it kind of goes with the other paper. I would encourage you to find these things and read and, and, and think very carefully through them because uh, this is very much still an evolving art um, and one that, you know, it, within the Quantum Center, we spend a lot of time still trying to figure out. In my own lab, um, we started with a similarly bad qubit. And, you know, in the past, there have been certain filtering things that didn't seem to be necessary in previous experiments or that I couldn't understand why people thought they worked. And so we were inspired by, by this work here and by how bad this qubit's numbers were, something like three microseconds or six microseconds, I forget. And again, you can see that, you know, this is jo June to October. We didn't quite do 15 cycles, but we did six or seven. And you see us just like cranking through and cranking through and systematically trying to change all these filters until we really arrived at something um, that worked and that worked reliably. And we've done this over the past several years, many, many times with many, many qubits, with qubits we borrowed from other people. Um, and so then we arrived you know, at our system and well, the, the, in the lab, we call it the armor can because it's like it's armored against everything we can possibly imagine. We also sometimes call it kitchen sink filtering because like it's everything and the kitchen sink too. Like anything anyone ever told us was a filter, we layered up and the more we did, the better things got. So this is for instance, what it looks like in the lab. These are those echosorb filters bolted onto a big copper housing. These are special thermalizing attenuators. I'll tell you more about in a minute. Um, Here's one of those really nice uh, mini circuits low pass filters. Here's the actual sample here. So this is all basically to provide that very clean environment on the lab with li lines with these last filters mounted in close proximity uh, to the sample. Here's actually a chin that, uh, how do we mount our magnet? Here's the spindle. And then I think you can even see here the bolts that it is bolted in place without glue. The this other stuff is aluminized mylar. It's basically super insulation. It's designed to reflect radiation. Um, we use it. It seems to make a difference, probably implying that we have lots and lots of stray photons bouncing around the inside of our cryostat. And then this was actually a suggestion from Wolfgang Pfaff that we ran with. We stuffed the whole can with echosorb foam. And this uh, really people raise eyebrows at it, but we did it. Our qubits got better. And so we keep doing it. It does also have, for people who are worried about vibrations, it has the nice um, feature that when we pack the can, it actually is compressed. So the echosorb is kind of acting like a mechanical 
restraint kind of holding the whole can together so that it hopefully shakes more like one unit. Maybe that makes a difference, maybe not. So in terms of what we do in the lab these days, sort of standard 3D transmons and tubes like we heard about for Suhas, we get 90, 50, 60, not world-class, but very reliable. Then we, when we borrow chips from, for instance, like the Hauk lab, we can measure 160, 130, 202, so really quite nice. And in some of our own uh, samples, we can sort of match these T1s. I would say in general, what we have found now is that with this filtering scheme, at least as of the moment, people can give us their very good qubits and we can you know, measure the right numbers with them. Is this filtering scheme like constant? Do I believe it is absolutely perfect? No, I really encourage people to do this kind of stuff. And then please put it in the supplements of your talks and the carefully drawn diagrams, and then I will cheerfully cite them uh, because this is not something that the field perfectly well understands. Okay. Um, hey Michael, so uh, there, there's a question regarding your qubit history. And from last plot, last plot, it looks like the echosorb filter inside your can helped the most to getting from 20 to 100. Is that correct? And can you comment on uh, that? So, I, so this is a, maybe this is not, the, this was not a simple qubit. It was part of a quantum module. It had a snail. And the idea is that the snail, um, is coupled very strongly to the output line. And so the snail can get poisoned just by loss, per cell loss, and then it can poison the, the um, transmon as well. So it's true that this was an important piece, but the other, the really important piece is that you see we added this filter on the pup line, one of these very, very low loss reflective filters, and it protected the snail and then by, by extension protected the, the qubit. So I think this, this is not like a single transmon sample, unfortunately which makes it a little bit messier. Um, but yeah, I think that's what's going on there. Because you see that like when we put the parametric pump line on, we were doing much better and then, oh, we went back down again. So this is like the introduction of the Purcell poisoning and this is fixing it with the right reflective filter. This difference here, you know, uh, is not so extreme. It seems that the Echosorb filter or the readout port helped more with T2 than with T1. Okay. okay. So questions on cables. So uh, what kind of flexible cable at mixing chamber do you use? Are they normal ones or made with special materials? So the best thing would be uh, thin whippy superconductors. So we buy naum titanium nitride ones and we kind of hand build them, but they're A, really, really expensive and B, they tend to break, but they're clearly the best, right? If I had infinite money, it would be all superconducting SMA. In practice, it tends to be like UTP-85, like a standard uh, magnetic connector and cable everywhere I can. And then we use like um, uh, UT-85C, so pure copper cables and non-magnetic uh, connectors that tend to reach inside the cans. Okay. Uh, you can, and in fact, you can see, um, I think sometimes the, where did it go? In this particular design here, the Echosorb things we bought and the commercial thing here, they're not non-magnetic. So here you can see, this is just UT85TP. So that's tin plated, um, you know, slightly magnetic copper cables used everywhere. Some people also believe strongly that degaussing the system would make a big difference. We have definitely tried that. Um, I guess we personally find the evidence a little inconclusive. Uh, your mileage may vary. And here you can see outside the can, again, these are all like mostly UT85 TP cables. We really only use the Supercon ones on um, quantum measurement experiments where the extra couple grand for the cables uh, really affects the science. Okay, so now I told you I don't have you know, an answer. This is not a tutorial where you do exactly this and everything will be fine. Just to complicate things further, to muddy the waters a little bit more, Things that we still worry about. So the heating of attenuators, I told you, is a big deal. Um, if you, for instance, try lots of pulses on your qubit and your qubit T1 just heads south, what often happens is that, that you're heating the last attenuators and that instead of seeing you know, a nice cold environment, you're seeing a really hot environment. So this is a nice paper out of Ben Palmer's group where they're trying to, for instance, build at the micro nanoscale better attenuators and model like how they shed heat to get a colder output line of the system. So that's really neat. And I think there's probably gonna be more work in this area. Um, you know, this is like purely homemade. You can also buy commercial attenuators where people have tried to do better jobs of, for instance, not steel housing. You see this is gold plated copper. 
um, changing the guts of side this thing to try to shed heat faster. It's not clear that they've really hit a slam dunk here, but we've definitely seen that some of these special attenuators uh, appear to help RT2. I think you saw them inside the armor can. So you can also buy, you know, for instance, quantum microwave. You can also buy them from XMA, attenuators engineered with better heat dissipation to reduce their temperature. If this is something that sounds interesting, I think this is a very interesting open area of research where there's more that needs to be done. These XMA attenuators that we use with the steel bodies, the thing I keep showing pictures of, are not designed for cryogenics. They're a room temperature component that we cool down. And the resistors inside are nichrome, a nice nasty magnetic binary alloy that doesn't go superconducting or do anything very strange. So they work. That does not mean you know, they're really envisioned for building a quantum computer. There's a lot of these sort of commercial components that don't quite match up with what we need. Um, one question is, does this get very cold versus something like Echosorb? Does Echosorb get very cold? And so this is a little bit of an old paper from my old group, uh, Dan Slichter at, at Irfan Siddiqui's group at Berkeley did. He took basically one of these kind of attenuators, one of these Echosorb filters, again, handmade, and he chopped back and forth to look at the power coming out into a power meter. And he changed the bath of his fridge. You see he's, here he's heating up the fridge. And so this is the temperature of the attenuator minus the temperature of this Echosorb filter. And one of the neat things he found, for instance, when he got to very low temperatures, so here the edge of the graph are rather low temperatures, was that it appeared that the attenuator was actually hotter than the Echosorb. And I think this has been echoed, for instance, in those Dave Schuster papers and our own results. The Echosorb appears to, even though absorb some heat, get very, very cold, maybe because it absorbs in a big area. It's not entirely clear. Um, but for instance, an Echosorb filter is sometimes the filter that people now put last in their system. You know, that's, that's a really interesting thing. What we can do about that, how we can make this better, I think is something that, that's worth thinking about. A kind of extreme version of this experiment of making sure that things get cold right before they get to your qubit. This is out of Michelle Devere's group uh, at, at Yale. This giant block has a very skinny cavity in it acting as an attenuator. So in our lab, we refer to it as like a cavtenuator. It's made out of solid block of brass, very simple, right? And what they find is that when they bolt this thing on, you know, they can take the, the in particular, the T2 time, which is sensitive to stray photons in the cavity, and, and, and move it up impressively by a factor of several in these systems, right? So clearly there's more to be done into how to find systems that won't kill your SNR, because this thing definitely will, that will thermalize just as impossibly cold as we can get them and do so while they tolerate large pulses. So this is really an area where there's much that needs to be done uh, and lots of you know, thermal physics and quantum physics we don't fully understand. Um, so this is now Chin Wang's, uh, work. So I think this is really neat. So ideally, we don't want any pair breaking radiation. That's bad. Ideally, we don't want any flux. That's bad. We want just pure superconductors with XQP of zero, as Chin Wang told us. However, if you have one, you can use it to fight the other. So although too many vortices is a bad thing, um, they do serve as a place for quasi particles to recombine. And so what Chin did in this paper is to cool uh, uh, transmons over and over again in different magnetic fields and measure both like the trapping rate that is when you recreate quasi particles, how fast do they recombine? You'll see it moves in these really neat steps that maybe suggest that there's different numbers of vortices in these different configurations. And then if you look over here on the right curve, it's not you know uh, the best transmon ever but you see that it gets substantially better when he cools it a modest magnetic field. So it really looks in this system that not only do we have all these problems that we showed you that they interplay with each other like in non-simple ways that for instance, some magnetic field and some vortices can help you tolerate some quasi-particle or pair breaking radiation. So just to make sure you know, that things are as complicated as possible. And then um, <laughs> just to add a little bit more salt to the wound, as the qubits get better and better, I told you at the beginning of the talk because somebody asked about vibrations, everything you can consider must be a problem at some level. And so there's evidence from Google and this paper is I think from, uh, from MIT Lincoln Labs where people start to see like cosmic rays or radiation, like not um, the word radiation meaning light, but like radioactive decay events messing with their qubits. And I have to admit that there have been a lot of professors concerned about this, or at least some of them for a long time. 
now it looks like maybe the qubits are good enough, you know, that this is really true. Does it mean that you need to do your quantum computing in the bottom of uh, an iron mine? Like, I really hope not. But again, I don't know. We need to do the testing. And then, for instance, in terms of why pair breaking radiation can really mess you up, this is another nice result here out of it's the bottom reference. Um, these top two references say that these pair breaking radiation can really interact with your Joseph's injunction and excite and de excite your transmon. But this paper from Robert McDermott's group also shows that um, these objects are basically antennas. This is an Xmon, this is a more standard transmon. They're very good at absorbing, they have these resonant modes up here at high frequencies. And so if you shine these, these crazy high frequencies, 100 to 600 gigahertz down into your fridge, uh, in fact, the structures you have built are pretty good at receiving them. So this is something else to worry about, right? Even if you have these pair breaking photons around, you could maybe ask, can we make transmons that are not such good antennas for picking them up out of the ether? Okay, um, that's me. I'm almost to the end here. One other thing, and this is related specifically to vibration that I will remind you, is everything also contracts when you cool it down. And it contracts differently depending on the material. So one problem we've definitely had in my lab is imagine this is your copper fridge plate here in orange. You've got some aluminum like sample box and you wanna use a brass screw to bolt the whole thing together. The model is roughly that these threads here are jammed. They can't really move, but this free area here can expand and contract. And so what happens is everything gets smaller, but some things get smaller -er when you cool them down. And now there's a gap. This thing that you bolted very tightly to thermalize and to transfer heat and to not vibrate is now completely loose, but only when it's cold. And so um, this is a trick. I think it's been around for a while. I personally learned it from Angela Koo. Uh, if you use molybdenum, it expands, uh, it contracts way less, which kind of you can think of it like it's effectively something that looks like it's bigger when, when things cool down. And so now, for instance, you can use this molly washer and its lack of contraction to sort of seal the system up and to keep it nice and tight. It doesn't do anything for you warm, but it will actually sort of tighten the system when it's cold. Um, that's awesome. But then we also found in the lab, and my student Ryan Kaufman did some of this research, if you're too overzealous, say more tighter is better, it's not true because you can exceed the uh, sort of the elastic, um, the, the, the elastic range of, of, of this material. If you stress it too much, you will stretch, stretch it out. So that's not good. And you can even sort of long-term damage it. If you've ever tried to take a head off a dull, dull fridge screw and just had the whole thing fall apart in your hand, you probably built a system like this where you overstrained it so much over time. So you need to have, you know, the right amount of strain here. You really need to understand the thermal properties of the system if these joints that are supposed to thermalize and hold everything rigid are really gonna work. And then um, this one is a little bit of a stretch, but not too much. And, and I just really enjoy it. Uh, this is as machined aluminum, like this is half of a shoebox. Hey, Michael, so a couple of questions on the yeah. washer. Yeah. Uh, do you have a specific torque for the uh, Mo washer? Yes, but it's specific on the screw and the kind of screw and what screw I bought. So what Ryan will basically do is cool things down, warm them up and measure if they're longer. And so we find this sort of very experimentally. Um, we don't do some fundamental calculations. So I do have a number, but I don't think it's a number that matters to you. Uh, you just need to measure it. You could take some nuts and tighten these screws and cool them down and figure this stuff out. There's a question saying, can we just use an elastic washer? Uh, I guess the question is what material? So are you aware of uh, a different material other than molybdenum? No, and the problem with like elastic washers like Belleville washers is that you have to figure out like what happens to the springiness of steel when you cool it down, right? I think most things become less springy. So um, we're trying to use here thermal properties that help us instead of thermal properties that, that that make it harder. Yeah, there there's uh, one older question. So for SMA connectors, is there a benefit to using soldered connector? Um, versus? I guess, I guess versus some connector that may just be clamped on, just pushed in, I, I imagine. Um, I think commercially, many of the vendors we buy stuff from, you know, some people weld them, some people solder them, a few people crimp them, especially materials like niobium and titanium, I think that are hard to solder to. Most of the cryogenic cables we have found are pretty robust. 
in the lab, we personally find that soldering um, works better than crimping, but that you know probably has a lot more to do with our ability, inability to crimp things like a real professional company would compared to the inability of like companies like Keycom or something to make you a crimped superconducting cable. Okay, um, right, so back to my, my thing I really enjoy here. This is an as-built shoebox cavity. This is one that we've polished basically with sandpaper on a granite block. And so here is, 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 is data. This is a older paper and a brand new paper from, uh, from Rob Sholkoff's group. And what they're doing here is for instance, taking a shoebox cavity with a certain kind of like roughness here and moving the location of the seam. If you put it at the edge, the seam really matters. If you put it in the middle, there's a symmetry point, it shouldn't matter at all. And what they show you here that the Q of the cavity as a function of this admittance of the seam, which we've heard about before, um, goes from devastating to sort of not a big deal. And it's devastating because this black dot that's partially covered with mine says that if you make the seam in the wrong place and it's just a standard machine seam, your cavity will be a thousand Q when you cool it down instead of something like 10 million. And in fact, in general, we see that these seams, basically the seam losses don't really change when you cool them down. So for instance, we repeated that data here. Here's our orange dot. It had a Q of around a thousand. This polished one, again, still in the bad place where it, up here at the top, had a Q of 350,000. And so you can see that something as simple as like how you treat these surfaces can make orders of magnitude difference in either the, the, the Y seam or the Q of the cavity. Now this is specifically in the case of um, Q of microwave circuits, but I think there's something also to learn here about how we join, join things together in general, right? Um, pressure matters, surface preparation matters. Uh, in fact, uh, this is showing also that we can polish copper seams and do copper to aluminum seams. Um, this is a weird image. Now everything's reflective. This is this thing being reflected in this uh, polished surface. And for instance, um, you know, we can get quite good cues here, even though the superconductor is made partly out of, out of copper, because these seams here, for instance, on a thin washer are dominating the losses. And so when we build stuff in the lab, every possible surface now, it both looks nice. You see here, we can see all these reflections. Um, this is a little confusing. This is a wood grain, fake wood grain plastic table. Here's the wood grain and the chip reflecting. You will see that in our work, we do a lot of this polishing here, both on the microwave circuits where we can prove to you that it really makes a difference. And people have done really neat things with diamond turning and stuff to take it even further, but also on the thermal joints, because uh, if you look in the, again, the old literature in Pobel and, and, and Richardson and these other things, you will find that these old cryogenicists uh, were quite concerned with making very, very low resistant seams in order to get heat flow to happen at these very low temperatures. Okay, um, and then one other thing that you consider is maybe how can we take this idea of like reflective filters, which are so nice and, and protect our qubits better while still being able to drive them. And so in, this is a different, you know, talk altogether, but I just want to point out in this uh, published paper and in this preprint, you will also see in my laboratory tricks where we use filters that actually protect the modes. The modes are all up here above in the low, stop band of a low pass filter and the transitions are all down here. We can also avoid the need for like attenuators by breaking the link by just saying, don't drive systems at the resonant frequency anymore. Figure out off resonant drives to do all the controls that you need to do. And so um, we're having a lot of luck uh, with that in our own experiments. Again, one of the key features here is how low loss is this, is this reflective filter uh, we talked before about if this is uh, very resistive, it can Purcell poison your snail coupler, which can Purcell poison all your qubits by extension. Um, I would again encourage you to saw things open. So here's a commercial mini circuits filter that we don't like sawed open. Here's one of the new ones that we do like sawed open. You know, you have to open it up, figure out what are the materials, what are their properties? Do you think it's gonna work cold? And then sort of uh, test the whole thing and figure out, in this case, for instance, is one on the right. I think works order of magnitudes better than this, this one here on the left, partly because it's made out of simple things inside like alumina and, and aluminum that we can understand their behavior of better when we cool down. All right, I, I think that's the end for me. I just wanna thank all the lab uh, who in addition to doing a lot of the work that I showed you today 
help me put together all these slides and make sure that I didn't, you know, get all my references and my facts wrong. And uh, I'm happy to take more questions. All right. Thank you, Michael. And uh, for everyone, um, let's give Michael a big round of applause <laughs> in silence. And you hear it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can at least see it floating. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, there's a question on your polishing. How do you get your copper to be so shiny? It's crazy, right? Do you clean it with any type of varnish that you can recommend? No, uh, in fact, this is um, this is a point where I can give a shout out to William Strang, who is the machinist in our machine shop that we share a wall with. This is uh, soapy water and sandpaper and a granite plate. In a lot of our experiments, we found that if you use like paste or like this soldering compound, you kind of move through different grits from bigger to smaller. If you don't get the big grit out, then it will totally mess up the smaller stage. And so the best we could find was sandpaper that's basically glued to a granite slab to keep it nice and flat, and then flowing water and soap to kind of wash away continuously the grit. So this is nothing fancy. It's you know a hundred dollar granite slab for McMaster and McMaster sandpaper, and um, now a certain amount of um, elbow grease from my students. We also, though, this stuff here was not all hand polished. If your machinist, you tell your machinist you want a mirror finish, if they have a nice like carbide steel or, or diamond tip uh, fly cutter, this is done on an end mill. In terms of like the quality factors we measure, at least at present, we can't really tell the difference between the two. All right. Um, now I have a couple questions that maybe slightly outside the scope uh well one is actually well one is actually on the flux bias line of your snail how do you flux bias inside the aluminum cavity i guess that's really <laughs> related to packaging but you did show your yeah experience. okay well you can see it like uh you can see it right here so it's true that when you have an aluminum tube that the net flux is canceled right but it's not the local flux and so if you simulate this stuff we find that Although the net flux is canceled, you have like a core of downgoing flux and then sort of a diffuse amount of upgoing flux at the edge. If you put a little flux loop right in the middle where it sees only the downgoing flux, the net flux of the big loop is zero, but you still get flux. In a similar way, if you have like a current bias flowing and you move a squid or a snail away or towards from it, even though you have these sort of uh, Meissner type effects, the local fields, right, can still be ununiform and you could use it to bias your your object. So that's that's this trick that you see us applying um, in, in several of these sample boxes I've showed today. So do we have more questions? So we have some time for more questions. So if you guys have any, please, please type them in. And there is actually a question not on cryogenics, but asking you, do you have any thoughts on room temperature IQ mixer setups? <laughs> so, <laughs> I'll um, give it some time for people to maybe give a couple uh, the chance to type in a couple more questions. And so you have anything to say to that? Yes. Um, so we are now enthusiastic users of the system Kick, this freely available software for uh, Xilinx eval boards. And then that allows us to basically just stop using room temperature IQ mixers. So my solution in my lab is to try to move as much as possible to these really uh, high rate DACs and just get rid of the mixers altogether. And if we can't get quite there, then to just use a three port mixer and a shift configuration. We own a lot of IQ mixers. We spend a lot of time worrying about them and stabilizing them, but we're much happier with the, with the kick with these new generation control electronics. Okay, cool. So uh, if we have no more questions, let's uh, let's thank Michael again. And uh, thank you everyone for joining our lecture series and all 90 of you who have made all the way through the eight lectures, I guess. Um, yeah, that's a, that's, that's a pretty good number. And thank you very much for supporting our um, tutorial series. And hopefully uh, this is a, a lot of good material for you to take home with. And Thank you, everyone, again. Um, yeah, thanks, everybody. Thanks for coming. And um, like I said, look for, for these lectures to get a, a permanent home on the CTQA website and the YouTubes. For now, the same YouTube link uh, I will post this hopefully before I go home today uh, for those who can't get enough. Thanks, everybody. Have a good weekend. Have a good summer. <laughs>